the smoke was so thick you couldn't see you couldn't see through it you couldn't see your hand in front of your face you're hoping you're never gonna have to face or go through fires like that the lights went out completely shut into darkness and then I'm now sort of rolling about on the floor in the dark um, with really just the noise of the roaring of the fire in the background. There have been so many changes since the King's Cross fire, not, not just to the underground, if you, if you look at King's Cross uh, as a place. This is King's Cross Station today, used by more than 95 million underground passengers per year. And here it is three decades ago, older, dirtier and more dangerous. On the 18th of November 1987, this message came through to the fire station in Soho. An escalator was on fire, it said. The reality was that a small blaze would become a disaster that would change London. Stuart Button was one of the first firefighters on the scene before the inferno took hold. It wasn't until we got to the head of the escalator, number four on the Piccadilly line, that we actually saw there was a fire. Um, it was a small fire, about four foot high, and it was going quite well. But then, suddenly, fire swept through the station. As we were laying the hose out, we could then hear all the screams coming from the entrances through the smoke. Just horrible screams and you thought. I thought to myself, I know there was more people around some of that concourse, around the outer edges, not too many people near the fire, but around the outer edges. And I just thought, I wonder how many people are caught up in that. I hope they got out. In fact, dozens had been caught inside. Among them, Damon Brodie, a 20-year-old who'd moved to London just five days earlier to start a new job. Everything unravelled really quickly, probably within a fraction of a second, and there was just this huge fireball um, from my right-hand side that just shot across the ticket hall. Um, and it probably best described as a kind of a wall of fire that just, just with a roar and a whoosh. I don't know that I knew really what had gone on. I mean, I knew that having been on fire, but I didn't, by that point, you know, I wasn't entirely set of my circumstances, um, or, yeah, or at least wasn't really thinking, I'm now stuck in a fire. I was just thinking, you know, I'm gonna die, and just thinking, well, you know, if I could make a deal with anybody right now, what, what would it take to get me out of here? What, you know, and I, and I struggled with that, you know, for years later, which was that kind of what, what kind of deal have I made to get out of here? I, you know, found that difficult too much later. Brody escaped, terribly burnt, but alive. 31 people, including a senior fire officer, died. This was the worst fire in the history of London's underground. As the scale of it became clear, a temporary morgue was set up and a young police sergeant was put in charge. Three decades later, Paul Crowther is now the chief constable of the British Transport Police. The enormity of it, I think, hit home quite early on, of, of just the scale of the, uh, of the incident itself and, and the loss of life. Um, I guess the things that stick with me were the, are the smells and the scene of uh, tired and exhausted firefighters. Uh, sat down sort of leaning against walls, you know, taking a breather from uh, the, the, uh, the enormous effort that had gone in. And 30 years ago, this is exactly where the King's Cross fire started, on the escalator up from the Piccadilly line. Now then, this would all have been made of wood and a discarded cigarette started a smouldering fire that rapidly took hold. As the flames grew, they turned into a fireball. And then we had the flashover effect that meant the flames came up the escalator in here into the ticket hall, where they engulfed everything and everybody that they came across. The ticket hall was rebuilt, but it's still in the same place and the memories live on of that terrible night. 
There isn't a week that goes by that somebody in some context doesn't talk to me about the King's Cross fire. It's very, very interesting. It's part of our fabric and we think about it all the time as the time that we really changed and created this brilliant world-class metro. At the time, the question that followed was why? Why had a small fire grown so quickly to cause such devastation? And here's the man who found the answer. Ian Jones led a team that investigated the cause of the blaze. They modelled the way the flames had behaved. In 1987, this was world-leading research, and they discovered how a small fire could race up a tunnel. Jones and his team used this, a Cray supercomputer that was the most powerful and expensive computer in the world 30 years ago. But Jones's analysis was not just about the chemical cause, it was also about something more profound, about a failed culture. One of the main conclusions is that fire safety is the responsibility of those at the top. I think that is one of the key conclusions. You can't just pass the buck down to the poor people who are responsible for, this, for the station. You have to give them the budgets. You have to take responsibility yourself. This fire was followed by a public inquiry that was strident in its criticism. Managers resigned, although none were prosecuted, and more than 150 different recommendations were gradually implemented. 30 years ago, King's Cross was a very seedy area. But since the fire, it's gone through a constant regeneration. Billions have been spent turning this into one of the most vibrant quarters of the capital. But the effects of this fire go way beyond London. Our emergency services learn so many lessons about how to respond to major incidents. Our transport companies finally took safety very seriously. This was a disaster that changed the fabric of British life. Pretty much everything you see in this great station and the rest of our network, from the training of the staff to the relationship with the agencies to the infrastructure itself is different. So it's fair to say it was probably the most pivotal event in the history of London Underground. I think back to the fact that um, there were smoking carriages on the tube. Can you think of that now? There was no radio system that worked underground. And a direct result of, of the King's Cross fire was the implementation of a radio system on, underground. Um, but so many other things, the uh, procedures for fire evacuations, the way that emergency services work together, uh, communications and, and joint training, many of the good practices we see today came about as a direct result of King's Cross. In 1987, the King's Cross fire was followed by grief and soul searching. And there is a grim coincidence that its 30th anniversary will come just a few months after the devastating inferno here at Grenfell Tower, a block of flats just four miles from King's Cross Station. The public inquiry into the Grenfell Tower fire is due to report back next year. Its remit, as it was with King's Cross, is to examine what happened and to try to ensure mistakes can't be repeated. I attended the inquiry at King's Cross and at the end of that inquiry lessons were learned and a whole host of uh, recommendations were published to make changes on the way, you know, all aspects of firefighting at underground stations were made. And the same will be at Grenfell. There'll be an inquiry um, and they need to learn the lessons from it. And for those whose lives were affected by the King's Cross disaster, there are echoes at Grenfell. Some believe crucial lessons were forgotten. So many lessons I don't think were applied to the Grenfell disaster. It was, I believe, a systems issue again of individual components behaving in one way and whether or not it was the fireproofing, the, the fire retardant panels that were fit, fitted on the facade, whether or not it was the air gaps, whether or not it was the failure of the barriers, the fire barriers that were situated between these different panels, I don't know. But the whole thing should have been looked at as a system, taking into account the modifications that are made through the building of these towers and then the maintenance of the whole facade on these buildings. 
The late 1980s saw a rash of disasters from King's Cross to the Herald of Free Enterprise, from Manchester Airport to Hillsborough. Each was followed by inquiries, by changes, and public life became safer. Like King's Cross Station, our world was rebuilt and rethought. And that's one of the reasons the Grenfell Tower Inferno was so profoundly shocking. We thought we'd left this behind. Adam Parsons, Sky News.